I do believe we're at the point in human evolution that we can extend the time of usefulness, probably by, you know, 15, 20 years at least, if not 30. I definitely think we can slow down the aging, revert the clock, our youthful time instead of the previous, you know, from 18 to 45. We probably mm. can go from 18 to 75. Dr. Joy, welcome to the show. Thank you, Seem. So good to be here. Yeah, you have a really amazing YouTube channel and uh, clinic where you discuss things related to stem cell therapy, which, you know, in the longevity space is somewhat of a, I guess, like a popular topic. At least it was uh, five years ago when I first heard about it. And uh, yeah, people are every once in a while you hear some people doing stem cell therapies and you know most people don't really know what it is. So I'm happy to have you on the show as, a, as an actual medical doctor who, you know, does this uh, therapy is uh, pretty much on a daily basis. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, eight years ago, that's when I first heard that stem cells were actually used on human beings mm. uh, in therapies. And when I looked into the signs, I just got so excited and because I've heard people having amazing results already. And since then, it has been just you know, I, I, it's been amazing to see how the public is beginning to understand and I'm really uh, kind of uh, allowing this therapy to spread everywhere. So mm. it's, um, yeah, a lot has changed for the last eight years when it comes to stem cells. Yeah, and I think maybe we can start with refuting some of the misconceptions. So like I, a lot of people have the idea that stem cell therapy is something like you harvest babies or something like that. So maybe you can, you can, you can like uh, briefly explain like what it actually is or, you know, how does it work? Yeah, so uh, stem cell therapy, there's so many kinds of stem cells in the body. We all came from a single stem cell. So that, that's what people have to realize. And from that, that one cell to us, right? You and me, you know, a flesh and blood and having all these complex organs, there are a thousand steps along the way, thousands of steps along the way from that single cell to us. And all along the way, there are all these different stem cells. They're all a little bit more uh, gaining more function, but reducing its potential. So one single stem cell can become anything else in the body when it, when it comes to first fertilized egg or even very early embryo within the first few days. The cells can become anything in the body. It's uh, the inner cell mass. That's the cells that are in the, in the cluster of the, uh, of the initial ball of cells. But as we keep developing and the cells keep uh, growing, then they start to gain a little bit more function and lose a little bit more potential. Um, so they become more and more focused on wh where they're going to evolve into until the very end when it evolves into an organ cell, right? Like the heart uh, will have heart muscle cells. So until it gets to an end organ tissue cell, it's a stem cell. But there are so many kinds of stem cells, you know, thousands and thousands of kinds. So people, I think people need to understand when we talk about stem cells, we're not talking about single type of cells. We're talking about all these variations, you know, all the different types of cells along this pathway. So what we're using these days, most researched right now is mesenchymal stem cells. But there's still a lot of other kinds of cells like hematopoietic stem cells. Those will regenerate the whole blood system. And there are other you know, tissue-specific cells. Endothelial progenitor cells will help you regenerate the lining of the blood vessel, but there's all kinds of you know, other uh, more specific cells, but uh, that's, those are not as commonly used. Gotcha. Yeah, so that's, uh, you're actually, you know, um, there's different ways to yeah like uh, produce them i guess or like uh, use that kind of a therapy so there's yeah so you can either get the cells from your own body because as adults we still have stem cells in our body that's why we can regenerate right we injure ourselves and then we can make new cells but our stem cells have certain limitations our stem cells are a little more sluggish than the time when we were born Right, we don't repair nearly as, as fast. I don't know. I know you you're still young, but even if you cut yourself, you don't repair. Your skin doesn't heal up as fast as when you were a kid, right? So things have slowed down, and uh, uh, not only we have 
more sluggish cells, but the number of cells have decreased as far as the number of stem cells. Just to give you an idea, mesenchymal stem cell is a type of cell that is everywhere in the body. Anywhere you have blood vessels, you will have these mesenchymal stem cells hugging the blood vessels and sensing what's going on in the blood and sensing what's going on in the neighborhood. So it's 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 talking to your entire body, but also talking to the place is is living. So it's it's conducting this interesting uh coordination like a conductor in the symphony uh you know of of uh, regeneration so uh these cells when we were born every one in 10,000 cells is a mesenchymal stem cells uh stem cell and when we get to our teenage years it becomes one in a hundred thousand. So you already have tenfold less, right? As far as ratio to your own cells. And then when you reach the, your forties, it becomes one in 400,000. When you reach your eighties, it becomes one in two million. So you can see the number of cells are just falling off a cliff. So these powerhouses for regeneration, you don't just don't have enough of them, right? You get less and less, less. It's almost like the signals are just fading and fading and fading. So no wonder people cannot repair as fast. You know, that's why we have osteoarthritis. You know, it's not a wear and tear disease. We wear and tear ourselves all the time when we we're kids. We just repair right away. We don't get chronic, you know, cartilage degeneration. But but that's what happens when we get older. We just can't keep up anymore. Um, and that's why we get all kinds of chronic illnesses. That's why we get cancer because our immune system can't keep up. You know, we don't have good uh, cells to replace the immune cells. So anyhow, so it's just global, it's like global fading. You know, everything is fading. The signals are fading. That's why stem cell therapy is so powerful because it's giving you back the signals. And all of a sudden, your body's like, oh, I was blind. Now I can see, right? All of a sudden it's, oh, okay. Okay. This is what I need to do. That's what's beautiful about stem cells is giving you the original, the powerful and clear signals for your body to repair. This episode is brought to you by Bone Charge, my favorite company for blue blocking glasses, red light therapy devices, and red light light bulbs. These items are essential for keeping your sleep wake on the cycles aligned in a world that tries to mess them up. Instead of looking at your phone before bed and letting the blue light disrupt your melatonin production, why not wear blue blockers instead that prevent that from happening? Instead of having your bedroom lit up with bright lights, use the more sleep friendly alternative by opting for flicker free red light light bulbs that don't disrupt your sleep. Bone Charge also has amazing infrared sauna blankets that can give you the same health benefits as the traditional sauna. You also get the unique benefits of infrared light that improves joint and skin health. Head over to bonecharge.com forward slash seamlund and use the code SEAM, S-I-I-M, for a 15% discount. And uh, this uh, decline in stem cell function is also one of the hallmarks of aging that uh, that has been identified as like one of the characteristics of the aging uh, process. Yeah. I mean, there are many uh, uh, angles to aging. There's mitochondria dysfunction, there's oxidative stress, there are you know, chromosomal changes and all that stuff. But I think if you fundamentally have enough stem cells, uh, you can address a lot of the problems. Because if you damage tissue, the, the end result is tissue damage. But if you can replace the damaged tissue, all of a sudden, you can you know, you can actually uh, have healthy tissue again and have healthy function. But if you run out of what can replace what's damaged, then, then yeah, then you're just going downhill. Mm, right. So, uh, yeah, I guess the next question would be like, you know, how can you, I guess we can start with, um, you know, what are like some of the therapies that people use uh, or like, yeah, like these t types of uh, stem cell therapies that to revert this um process and uh, what are like some of the results that you've seen in your practice and like in some other like other like any like actual clinical trials on this stem cell therapy on i guess like age-related decline and uh, yeah yeah there's so many um studies of course, of course on all kinds of conditions but even on aging decline there are some studies so if people are interested i actually uh, gave that lecture at a few conferences it's called the anti-aging benefits of stem cell therapy I actually went over some clinical studies. A lot of them are animal studies because it's hard to study human lifespan, right? <clears throat> the researchers probably won't be alive by the time the results are, are out. So they were looking at models 
of shorter living animals like mice and rats. They only live for about 20 months. So you can study what happens when you give them stem cells and what it does. You know, if you give them younger cells, stem cells, what either human or from, from rats or mice, what happens to these animals? And then there are also some human studies showing that it can indeed improve a lot of parameters of aging, such as, you know, what you can observe skin, hair, uh, you know, growth and, um, energy level, sex drive, et cetera. But in animals, they were able to dissect the animals. They sacrificed the animals. Um, I'm never happy about that, but, but anyhow, but that's what they found out. Um, the, when you give young or older animals, um, either middle aged or much older, like senior animals, stem cells. So let's say somebody's middle aged in their forties. So when they give mice of that age, you know, 30, 40, you know, middle age, uh, consistently, they were able to show that by giving regular young stem cells, these animals are living uh, 30% longer. So that has been consistent. And then if even if you give the animals, uh, older animals, which is equivalent to human age of 75 years of age, even if you start at that point, starting to give them young stem cells, the time remaining for these animals to be on earth actually is extended of three times as long. So, so, so basically if you were only going to have one month left and they ended up living for three months and not only they were living longer because a lot of people don't care. I don't care how long I live, but I need to live well, but that's what they showed in these animals. Not only they lived longer, but they lived better. They look younger, their furs are shinier, their spine is straighter, and their motion, local motion is better, and their mentation, ability to run mazes, etc., are better. So all around, all their functions are improved. And then when they dissected their muscles and their brain tissue, they actually were looking at neurotransmitters like acetylcholine. They were looking at different growth factors. They were looking at senescent markers and toxic waste. Everything was brought back to the younger state, to the level of the younger state. And that was a pretty powerful, uh, you know, pr pretty powerful evidence that indeed stem cell therapy can dial back the clock and bring a person or bring an organism to a younger state. Mm, wow. What about like humans? Are they like, I guess it's harder to do like these long-term studies in humans. We're, we're not dissecting human brains or human muscles, but um, they did check, uh, you know, different parameters of a person. Uh, they did see that in people who have a lot of chronic inflammation, the inflammation was decreased and their function was better, that they, you know, their hair, nail, energy level, sex drive were improved. And then for aging populations, people with frailty who, you know, lost body strength and uh, muscle mass and were prone to falling, they were actually showing that it reduced their frailty and improved their life quality. So those are some of the studies. Uh, what's the like situation currently with like the FDA or some of the like regulations? Like I've heard that that uh, a lot of people like fly to like this Panama or some other like uh, Caribbean countries to do stem cell therapy. Uh, because uh, for whatever reason, so like, uh, yeah, what's the situation with like the regulations of, uh, of stem cell therapy? Yeah, so 2017 is when the FDA came out with a guideline. So uh, basically, FDA is an agency that regulates drugs, right? So um, are stem cells a drug? So the, what their determination was that if you do not manipulate and change the cells, and if you allow the cells to function, it, it perform the same kind of function as they were in the donor, you know, w after they are transplanted in the recipient, then is not a drug. And then is a tissue transplant. Just like transplanting heart, liver, kidneys, you do not need an FDA approval for the transplantation because that's considered the practice of medicine. And the mm -hmm. FDA does not regulate the practice of medicine. The medical board in different states regulate the practice of medicine. You know, as a medical doctor, 
<clears throat> we can do whatever we think is necessary to help a patient repair and heal. Um, we can do even some very strange things, as long as you can back yourself up right in front of the medical board, as long as you can show that, okay, these are the literature showing that this therapy has been helpful. And this, these are the rationales and these are the safety, you know, that I have seen. And, and so you, if you can support yourself in wh whatever therapy you can do. So that's the practice of medicine. So the FDA says, okay, if you don't manipulate the cells and you're allowing the cells to function, uh, perform the same functions as prior to the, to the transplantation, then you are performing tissue transplant and uh, you don't have to go through drug studies. But if you start to change the cells, like if you start to use enzymes and chemicals, you alter the cells, or if you grow the cells in a culture, which does change the cells and changes genetic expressions, then they said, then is a drug, you can only give it to people if it's under a clinical study. So that's the, the stance of the FDA. This is one reason why all these overseas companies are giving people stem cell therapy, but they were using expanded cells. So growing them in a culture to huge numbers. That would not be, they will not be able to do that in the US unless they are doing a clinical study, but that's costly, time consuming. It's, it's a long, you know, you know, long process. So a lot of uh, these companies decided that, you know, we can go overseas. We don't have to do a clinical study. We, we can grow the cells and give it to people. And, um, and, and, and this is why that people think, oh, yeah, we can only get stem cells overseas, which is, it's still a, you know, very interesting, um, myth that continue to persist because the number of stem cell clinics in the U.S. has quadrupled in the last five years. So the number just kept growing and growing, even though nobody can do ads because Google, Facebook, Instagram would not allow any doctors to run ads on stem cells because they consider stem cells uh, a form of miracle cure or, or uh, uh, unproven therapy, even though there's so much research from all around the world. But somehow these uh, executives, I guess, at these giant companies decided uh, what what's considered appropriate uh, medical, you know, what, what, what's legit, legitimate and what's not. It's very interesting. So even though doctors cannot run ads, cannot tell the world that they're doing this, um, you know, on a more mass scale, the number of clinics has quadrupled. That's how powerful the therapy is because it's the patients who are looking for it because it actually worked for so many of them. So it just spread, you know, if you had a terrible knee, your own orthopedic surgeons are all telling you that you need to replace the knee. And then you, in desperation, you decided to get stem cell treatment and your knee's fixed. I mean, wouldn't you want to tell your friends like I didn't have to replace my knee. I mean, I, it, it's fixed. It's good. I can walk and then, you know, I'm not in pain. Everything is good. So that's how it spread. Um, and of course I've had, um, presented, uh, on stem cell therapy for a diverse disease, uh, diseases. It's including autoimmune conditions, brain conditions, um, heart, lung, you know, liver and, and kidneys and, and, and skin. Uh, there, there's lots of uh, lots of research on all these major disease categories showing some benefits. So yes, and that's what we've seen clinically as well. So um, when people think that they have to go overseas is because of the, I think there, there are two factors. One is that embryonic stem cells were banned. Well, not exactly the research is not banned it's the destruction of embryos that were banned by george w bush uh, by george bush and uh that was uh because the ethical concerns of destroying an embryo but it, the research can still be conducted on the embryos that were already destructed uh, destroyed so that's uh, still ongoing but you cannot give people embryonic stem cells. So that cannot be done in the U.S. unless it's under a clinical study. And this is why it's done overseas. And the other thing is, um, I think it just...
because you can't use expanded cells. So all of a sudden they said, oh, if you want to get 100 million, 200, 300 million cells, then you have to do it overseas. In the US, the, you can only get a tiny amount of what we call native cells. So these are cells that have not been expanded or not manipulated in any way. Doesn't mean that they're not as powerful uh, because I've seen research showing a small number of native cells, let's say 100,000, actually exactly a research study showing 100,000 of native stem cells, not expanded, is more potent than 1 million expanded mesenchymal stem cells. So these are MSCs. So just by expansion and giving you more doesn't mean that it's more effective. It could be less effective. So this mm. is why I think people need to understand just because you're going overseas, you think you're getting a lot of cells, but what kind of cells are you getting? Are they really giving you what you're, you're hoping for? Because by having a lot of subpar cells, you could be getting less result less benefit. And mm. that's what I've seen in my clinic as well. I could give a fraction of what people are receiving overseas, but I have just as good, if not better results. I mm. think because right. one, the cells are not stressed to the point where they were secreting a lot of inflammatory molecules. Mm -hmm. Two, they have not differentiated, starting to express different, uh, you know, changing their genetic expressions and, and, and making new proteins, expressing surface markers that actually mark them as foreign. Because the moment you let the cells grow in the culture, they all start to, to, to develop, differentiate, you know, becoming a little bit more specialized and growing these surface markers. And all of a sudden, these surface markers are consistent with the genetic expression of another human being, right? So now you've got a chance for rejection because you're just growing it blindly in a culture medium. What's interesting is that when a cell goes inside a human body, especially younger cells, they're so much more capable of adapting. So they, they, they somehow, I don't know how it works. <laughs> I think this is beyond more medical, metaphysical discussion of how the cells know, right? The cells, if there's in, they're in the body, they behave differently than when they're in a petri dish or in a culture, uh, in, a, in an incubator. They have a way of working with the body. So um, when you are just letting them grow in a incubator, then they can just freely express whoever they were. And then when they inject, are injected into these various individuals, there are a lot of times there could be rejection type of reaction. This is why, you know, I, Tony Robbins, in his book, he said, well, just be prepared. You will get a cytokine reaction because that's a cytokine storm. That's part of the stem cell therapy. No, it's not part of stem cell therapy. It's because you're getting expanded cells that have expressed all these surface markers and the cells are stressed and are secreting these inflammatory molecules. So all of a sudden your body's reacting to this. This is why mm. one of my patients who went to Mexico, actually because of Joe Rogan's podcast, went to the same clinic, got stem cell treatment, and got extreme fatigue for two months. Not only him, but the 20 people he was in touch with who were all at the clinic at the same time, they all got the same thing, extreme fatigue. So this is actually a 9-11 responder. Um, we, we, we did um, an interview together. He explained the process. So if people want to look up, it's just 9-11 mm -hmm. and put my name in there, Joy Kong. So... He started having improvements in his lung symptoms, right? A lot of damage in, in the lungs from the debris of 9-11. And uh, two and a half months after the treatment, he was able to uh, start to have an improvement in his lung symptoms. But then he found me. He, he realized, oh, I guess I didn't have to go to Mexico to get a treatment. So let me right. just come to California. And then when he got our treatment, there's absolutely no fatigue. Actually, there's increased energy. He sends this surge of energy. And by day three, he already noticed improvement in his breathing. So this is a difference, right? I'm giving him a fraction. If you just look at the numbers, a lot less. But mm. I think it's better. It's safer and it's more effective. Right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's a lot of these things. If they're not regulated, there's a lot, then there's a lot of like, uh, I guess, bad actors or even like not bad actors, but like questionable actors <laughs> coming in and uh yeah like uh, cutting corners somewhere or uh, doing something uh 
else that uh, isn't like the most safest or effective way to do it. And the same, you can find the same in like supplement industry and a lot of other uh, like similar industries as well that are like aren't that regulated. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, it's a very confusing field. I didn't realize how con confusing it is for the public. I, I'm still mm. getting all my videos. I put out so much material trying to educate everyone, but I'm still getting a lot of questions, which really shows that this is a complex subject to somehow, you know, it, and a lot of myths and a lot of misunderstandings. So so I'm just going to keep repeating myself until mm -hmm. <laughs> it gets across. Yeah. <laughs> how, how did you get interested in stem cells in the first place and how did you like become a doctor on the on the subject uh i was uh you know i was a trained as a psychiatrist um but i've always been interested in in health and wellness right that's why i became a doctor i'm fascinated by the human body i wanted to live a really healthy life i want i respect you know this body i've been given and um and i realized after going through medical school i went to ucla where we had like half an hour on nutrition like that that's it right we, the, the doctors all we were taught on how to keep people healthy or or or, or a mantra you know uh, you know basically as doctors we after 4 years of training what we learned is to wait until people get sick so that's that's all you do once people are sick now we come alive. Okay, great. You're sick. Now I'm useful. Now I can do all these tests. I can, you know, look at your symptoms. Now I can figure out why you're sick. What's going on? The entire training is about diagnosis, right? Differential diagnosis. You're looking at all these potential diagnoses. Come to one diagnosis. Why is diagnosis so important? Because drugs are proved according to diagnoses. So if you have a diagnosis, then you can plug into a particular drugs and then, then you're done, right? You're good because I found the solution. I found the cause of the problem, which is the name of the disease, and I have the solution, the drug. So, but we are not equipped on keeping people healthy. So to prevent them from being sick in the first place. And the, we have a mantra of, uh, you know, all we tell people, you know, as far as helping them to be healthy is you eat healthy, exercise, and don't be stressed. <laughs> so that, that was our mantra. Yeah, yeah, that, those are the three things. That's, that's what we're trained on. We're trained on, you know, the, the holistic health aspect, how to say these three things. And of course, we all can say it very well. So th apparently that's not adequate, right? How do you optimize? Let's say I have a little bit um, issue with indigestion, right? Maybe constipation. Maybe my, you know, I have a little bit of brain fog the traditional conventional medicine has nothing to offer. We don't know what to do. Brain fog, well, you know, oh, eat healthy, exercise, and don't be, you know, reduce your stress. Then it will get better. That's all we know. So it's not adequate. That's how I became interested in integrative health. I was like, there must be more detailed approach to how we can enhance health. And while I was looking into that, I ran into, and then I also realized the inadequacies of psychiatry. Mm. Uh, as fascinating as it is and as empowering as it can be with all these psychiatric medications to get people out of depression, out of anxiety, and also out of psychosis. The problem is that it's still not addressing the root causes. And it has the belief that our brain has nothing to do with the rest of the body, except for a little tiny gland called the thyroid gland. That's the only thing they check. They check one TSH, and that's all they do. And then once that level looks okay, and they think that, okay, now we are, um, you know, we're addressing the effect of the body. And then everything now we can focus on the brain. We can focus on, focus on your neurotransmitters and the different brain regions. That's all we need to do. And it's so short-sighted. And it's really sad because you're not serving the patients. So when I was looking at ways of connecting the body with the brain, because knowing everything can affect the brain, right? Your hormones, your toxicity, your microbiome. Everything can affect your oxidative stress, can affect your brain. So in that process, that's when I you know, met another doctor who was doing stem cell therapy, who was, you know, a little ahead of me. And he said, hey, I just give this kid stem cell transplant. I give him umbilical cord stem cells and look at all these things that was that were changed. This is an autistic kid. And I had dealt with autism as a psychiatrist, and I did not enjoy it because we couldn't make much of a difference in these kids' life, lives. And all we could do was to sedate them, basically. 
We're giving them something to, you know, may, maybe stimulants to help them to focus and calm them down a little bit and give them antipsychotics, antidepressant, you know, to, to basically to calm them and maybe reduce some of the depressive symptoms or anxiety symptoms. Uh, but basically, um, they, they are still very much not relating and they're still dysfunctional. Mm. And seeing what a simple stem cell transplant can do for these patients, that was mind boggling that you gave this patient what? Some cells? And all of a sudden, there are all these ch incredible changes happening that I cannot bring about when I'm a psychiatrist, you know, th that's what I'm trained in. Um, that was powerful. So what is going on with these cells? Why are they able to make these, you know, profound changes? So that's how I got into it eight years ago, um, knowing that case. And then, of course, then it was case after case. And I started treating patients and, and seeing profound shifts, mm. um, saving them from, you know, from you know, some people from having to drag around oxygen for COPD or having to have knee replacement or, um, yeah, it, it just, there, I've seen a, a lot of uh, it, a tremendous results. Mm. So that fuels my passion and still to this day, because new conditions come up with, you know, interesting scenarios, and then people are getting interesting, you know, really, really great results. So that was, um, that has been the driving force. Hmm. Well, have you like tried yourself? These, uh, no, stem absolutely. Cells? <laughs> Bet. I wouldn't, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't not utilize it. So when I started stem cell therapy, I was 45. So now I'm 53. So that's eight years. Um, 45. I didn't know I was aging. Uh, I now know because when Facebook sends me happy anniversary, you know, pictures, that's when I look at it now as, oh my God, you know, I, mm. I was aging. I didn't know. So when you're in the midst of this aging process, you see yourself every day. There's almost like your brain is adapting to it. There's a sense of denial. You're looking at yourself, your picture and, or your photo you know, you think you look the same. I remember clearly my dad told me, he said, one day I looked in the mirror and I realized, oh my God, I got old. I mean, you didn't just yeah. get old, you know, that one day, right? But your brain made a shift. You suddenly see it. So that's what's interesting. So when people start to decline, you know, as far as visibly, probably in their 30s, um, early 30s, some people even younger, you know, in their mid 20s, you can see on their on their face, they started to have decline, but they may not, a lot of them may not see it. So I wasn't seeing it when I was 45. But on I, I thought, you know, I'll do stem cell therapy on myself, because I heard how it improved people's energy, focus, sex drive, you know, they, they, you know, if they does all these things to improve their health, I'm sure it's going to do great things for me. So at the time there weren't, um, that much anti-aging evidence yet. So I did it just because, you know, based on my understanding how these cells work, I figured it would be good for me, but mm -hmm. I've been doing, um, IV stem cells on myself every three months for the last eight years. Right. Because I believe in the science and, and evidence just kept coming out more and more. And yeah, it, so now it, it uh, you know, I know what it can do. It brings everything in my body back to a younger state. So, mm. uh, and you're going to keep doing it for, for decades more. Forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For the rest of my life. Yes, absolutely. I do believe we're at the point in human evolution that we can extend the time of youthfulness, probably by, you know, 15, 20 years, at least, if not 30, you know, even more. Um, we, I definitely think we can slow down the aging, revert the clock, um, our youthful time instead of the previous, you know, from 18 to, let's say, you know, 45. We probably mm. can go from 18 to 75. That mm. it's considered still considered youthful, right? When you're 65, you look the same as when you were 45. You know, that's like no big deal. That just that's just how it goes. So we're gonna change the human health landscape because of this this powerful tool. There are other right. tools too. I mean, there are a lot of tools. Uh, so if you use them all of them together, it's gonna be even more powerful. Mm, yeah, and yeah, you know, 
maybe in the next few years there's going to be even something more powerful or some like advancement in the technology so yeah like it's it's like continuous process of you know new discoveries and you know, i guess yeah like the sad part is that it's not being tested as rigorously as there is like potential out there so like this you know fda is one example of i guess uh putting the brakes on these kind of things and and uh yeah like you know in a perfect world we would already have like a lot of clinical trials on stem cells and like all these peptides and other things as well just to see okay what is the actual evidence because but right now it's just not being researched uh that much like uh, rigorously yeah i think this goes to show uh the power of money right mm. whoever controls money controls a narrative so um i mean big pharma insurance company i mean they're these are powerful entities and they are doing great. They're doing mm -hmm. great while people are being very sick, right? People are chronically sick. They all come in. Like I worked at the VA hospital, veterans hospital. All these veterans come in with bags of medications. They're all put in a, in a Ziploc bag and either 10, between 10 to 20 medications. That That's, uh, no, between 10 to 30 medications. That's what they come in with. So those are all money every month, right? All those are, that's, they're paying. These people don't have much money, but oh, they're paying for it. What the insurance company, they, they've got an internal system going on. The insurance company are making great money, right? Between the insurance company and big pharma, they're doing really, really, really well. So why change, why switch gear when it's working so well? So this is a huge paradigm disruption. Uh, it's going to take time, but there's going to be a lot of resistance. And we've seen the resistance. And we all know uh, a, a significant portion of the funding of the FDA comes from big pharma. So mm -hmm. if you're taking money from somebody, uh, I don't know, you've taken money from somebody, you know, you, you do feel obligated to them, right? So anyhow, uh, it's a whole other discussion. Mm. What about the cost of the stem cell therapies right now? So like... As I understand it, it's not like it's not like super cheap, or it's not as cheap as like some yeah. supplements or right. It's not cheap, but it's not exorbitant either, considering the value. So, um, I think there's a wide range between starting. You know, five thousand dollars would be the cheapest it probably you can find, and then up to about thirty or even fifty thousand dollars. So that's kind of the range. Um, and overseas is, is about the same. Um, partially because doctors, these are pioneering doctors who are willing to provide the treatment because still not FDA approved. You know, it's kind of sad about this FDA approval. If anyone's interested in what FDA approval really means, maybe take a look at the documentary, The Bleeding Edge, just to look at the FDA approval process. So that was about a medical device, uh, medical devices. Um, so, and I, I can't tell you how many, I mean, just, just go look on the, you know, find any medication, FDA approved medication, look at potential side effects, serious side effects, but those are all approved. Those are all fine. So if I'm a doctor who sticks with FDA approved drugs, I am perfectly safe. I never have to worry about my license. I'm, you know, as long as I'm giving them, you know, according to the, the this formula, right? You get sick, I diagnose you, and this medication is indicated for this diagnosis, and I give it to you. Doesn't matter if the medication make you really sick, uh, may debilitate you, or even cause you death. I'm completely protected because it's listed, it's FDA approved. All these side effects are listed. So I'm perfectly safe. So if you want to be a very safe doctor, you never want to worry about anything happen to your practice, then yes, then you stick with everything the FDA has approved. But if you want to go outside the box, if you see something that can be potentially powerful in healing your patient because you swore an oath, that's what you're going to do, that your job is to help relieve suffering, uh, then you're taking a risk because you are you're going into an unprotected cat you know territory mm. and that is partially why the cost is higher that these doctors are taking a risk and they may not be willing to take the risk unless they are properly compensated um so right. that's that, that's one reason yeah mm. um so it's more about yeah like some sort of so so like i guess like the the stem cells themselves uh which, which what makes the price higher is it like the stem cells themselves 
is it uh, yeah like uh, the transport of them or um, the procedure itself the injecting and or is it yeah some something related to the regulations or something uh it's the combination because yeah. you can use stem cells from your own body. Mm. So that's a medical procedure. Let's say we get stem cells from you, uh, from fat tissue. So they do a mini liposuction or from your bone marrow. So they drill into your bone. So it's a medical procedure. It's like a mini operation. So doctors, why do surgeons charge so much? Why do they charge, you know, 20, 30, you know, $50,000 <laughs> for an operation, right? There's, there, what's their cost? They're probably low. But they're charging for their expertise. So mm, if you, yeah. you're getting the surgery, you know, I don't see any patient asking the, the doctor, oh, what's your cost of surgery? Mm -hmm. Well, the cost is not very much. If you, uh, if you disposable, you know, medical, you know, uh, pieces of, um, you know, uh, you know, you, you don't want to like a unskilled doctor to do it. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah, They're charging you for their expertise. So it's the same yeah. thing for stem cell treatment. Um, so th they are going to charge you whatever they see as fit, right? From their training, from the risks they're taking. So that's how they charge you. Um, if you're using birth tissue stem cells, then the stem cells themselves are fairly costly. So that adds to the cost. Mm. Um, gotcha. yeah, but you don't need to do the procedure and the cells are a lot younger and more potent, actually safer. We didn't talk about that, but they're actually safer because they're younger. The umbilical cord cells are safer than your own stem cells because these cells retain a lot of the abilities to recognize cancer. One of the only potential side effects from stem cell treatment is the exacerbation of cancer. So the type of cells we use these days are not ones that can cause new cancer. If you use embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells, those two categories, the cells can go haywire and start to form new cancer. But other types of cells, stem cells from your own body or stem cells from the umbilical cord or placenta, they can't do that anymore. But there's a potential they can tell everything to grow, including cancer. But if they're younger cells, they can tell certain cells are not uh, <laughs> right cells. There's something wrong with the cells. Then they can recognize it and send signals to to tell the cells to die. But if you're using your own stem cells, uh, they've shown that a lot of times has lost that intelligence. So that can tell everything to grow. So because we have cancer cells coming up all the time, our immune system are just getting rid of them. But all of a sudden, if you have all these signals to tell everything to grow, your immune system may not be able to overcome overpower that. And now you've got a exacerbation of existing cancers. So that is a potential. This is one reason why I believe using younger cells is important because it's actually uh, the responsible thing to do for patients because, you know, considering the, the, the prevalence of um, cancer cells in our body. Mm, right. So the umbilical cord is uh, superior to your own uh, stem cells. Yeah, they have direct studies. Using mm -hmm. fat-derived MSCs versus umbilical cord-derived MSCs, they put these cells next to cancer cells, so the glioblastoma, right, very virulent form of brain cancer. They put it in a Petri dish. They put these two types of cells next to the cancer cells. And they also put it on an animal's body, um, planting them right next to the cancer cells. In both cases, the fat-derived stem cells made the cancer cells grow. And mm -hmm. the umbilical cord stem cells make those cancer cells to go away. Mm. So that's how vastly different they can be. Right. How does the process of getting the umbilical cord stem cells looks like? So it's the it's the umbilical cord that is detached during a birth. So yeah, like... Yeah, so um, we, of course, um, you know, the product we use are only obtained from healthy young mothers or so under age 30, living in the United States, have gone through regular prenatal care, and when they're about to give birth, they're asked if they want to save the cord for their own baby. And 90% of them say no, because it is costly. It costs about a few thousand dollars a year to store the tissue. So then they're asked if they want to donate. And once they say yes, then they're asked to fill out a very extensive questionnaire to screen out anything that could potentially affect the quality of the cord. And that will include the their own personal 
health history, their travel history, work history, uh, family history, toxic exposures, um, uh, sexual history, and prenatal history, of course, and um, and also the partner's history. So everything is screened for to make sure that we are um, protecting the the health of the court, right? If we're going to accept a donation, and of course in the U.S. The mothers cannot be compensated in any way for the donation mm. because the sale of human tissue is prohibited. Right. So they can't be even given like a token a gift. So yeah, so there's no incentive for people to lie. That's the that's the process. So so when the mother is about to give birth, uh, this has to be a scheduled C-section. This is a planned C-section. We, we don't take emergency C-sections. So mm -hmm. planned C-section, we want C-section because that's a surgical field, right? You're taking out the baby in the placenta in a sterile environment. So there's no contamination. But if you go through the vaginal canal, there's a lot of contamination that can happen. Mm. So um, when the baby's born, the C-section happened and the baby's healthy crying and then you cut the cord and now you can put the cord and then placenta into a bag and then deliver, you know, in normal saline and deliver that to the lab to be processed. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, so as you imagine, like, yeah, like, because, you know, you have millions of babies born every uh, every day. So it's only the, the C-section, the organized C-section. Yeah, there's no right. shortage of cords. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, so in the U.S., there's just a lot stricter um, mm. standard for prenatal care. Um, and also for us, we actually make sure the donors are adhering to certain uh, health practices, including diet, exercise, and certain vitamins to really optimize their pregnancy. Mm. Is there any way like that the stem cell, so you, you know, you're know you getting the stem cell from another person, uh so like all this, you know, from the umbilical cord, so is there like any, I guess like, the, it, it, because you hear these stories that you, <laughs> you do as like a surgery and you adopt some of the characteristics of the person who you got the organ from, for like, if you have a heart of some. Yeah, uh, organ <laughs> is a huge amount of cells, right? That's, right. that's an incredible a large amount of tissue from somebody else. Um, that probably is more of a possibility. But to the extent of what we're using in stem cell therapy, as far as injecting into the veins or into local tissue, we're putting in the magnitude of millions to a few hundred millions cells, let's even say a billion. Um, our body has 37 trillion cells. So you're really kind of putting a tiny little drop in this gigantic ocean of, of cells. Um, hmm. The issue with the, uh, how the cells work is that they go into your body, and they, they perform all these uh, functions, but then they will die. So when you activate cells, when you activate certain uh, life, right? A cell is a life form. Nothing lives forever. There's a lifespan. So the cells have a lifespan. And also it's possible if they start to differentiate, your immune system may recognize them as foreign. That can happen. But there are also instances where the cells live in the body and stay in the body, even if they are genetically different. But the amount is so small that it's not going to make vast changes to the person. So um, I wouldn't worry about that. Just an interesting fact that a lot of people don't know. The exchange of DNA among human beings is actually a very common phenomenon that people don't realize that we as humans walk around with other people's DNA in our body all the time because the stu study had found out that 60% of women actually have Y chromosomes in their body. So mm -hmm. that is not explained by the fact that they had uh, miscarriages of male children or they were in their mother's womb. There was a sibling, male sibling that had died. No one knew about. So they couldn't figure, you know, they, they accounted for all these factors. The only explanation that they could make as far as <laughs> the prevalence of white, white chromosomes is because of sexual intercourse. So something as common in human existence as sex could conduct DNA exchange. Um, yeah. 
So it, right. it's it's way more common. Yeah, if you have sex, then you probably are you know participating in in, in DNA exchange. So uh, it's not as f- scary or strange as it sounds. Right. Yeah. So let's say you know there's different uses use cases for uh, stem cells for like anti aging or some joint injuries or something else. So are there any, I guess, different types of stem cells used for different purposes or, or yeah, like different procedures or different like protocols? Yeah, I do believe stem cell therapy is still at its infancy. There could be breakthroughs coming up, you know, um, but as far as what we have right now is more kind of promoting this reparative mechanism of the body the stem cells because of how it works that would determine what it can help right so the way it works is that it calms inflammation so it drastically reduces inflammation and that can have profound effects on a multitude of chronic illnesses because almost all chronic illnesses has inflammation as the driving force and then it can balance the immune system so it can help shift your immune balance to a more anti-inflammatory state and and chronic illnesses you know, most of them also have immune imbalance as part of the mechanism. And then it can break down scar tissue. It can form, help form new vasculature. So promote more nutrient and oxygen delivery and toxic removal. It can, uh, it can rescue damaged tissue when cells don't have to die. It literally can send signals to re- reverse apoptosis. So it can reverse program cell death to rescue cells that don't have to die, like in, in some circumstances like radiation damage or stroke or crush injury, some of the cells that did not get deprived of oxygen and nutrients end up dying in the neighborhood because of the signaling. So stem cells can rescue and reverse those kind of signaling. It can also cause cancer cells to die. So it directly can kill off cancer. It also has direct antimicrobial properties. It can kill off microbes in addition to boosting your immune system's function to fight microbes. And then it can conduct mitochondria transfer. We all know mitochondria dysfunction. It's plaguing our population and causing so much of the decline. And stem cells, young stem cells have fresh new mitochondria. And the cells can actually transfer these mitochondria to the host's uh, cells and elevating the cellular energy in the recipient. So, So that's these are all the functions. So looking at how it works, that informs us, us of how and what conditions it can help. So that would include, you know, the evidence I've seen, autoimmune disease, that is like bread and butter that has tremendous evidence. It could be rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, psoriasis, um, things like, uh, you know, thyroiditis, or uh, or even MS and a lot of neurodegenerative conditions, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and, and ALS, et cetera, uh, traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injuries, and then you come to the internal organs, heart, lung, uh, your kidneys and liver. Um, I've seen fertility improve, and we've you know, as far as muscular skeletal repair, that's the bread and butter again. So muscle, bone, um, cartilage repair and, um, and skin wound healing, et cetera. So really wide range of evidence. This is not just a potential that I'm talking about. I'm talking about evidence. The research have already been done showing benefits. And of course, clinically, I've seen a lot. And um, autism, I'm actually presenting in Brazil in a week on stem cell therapy for autism. So there's also evidence of stem cell therapy helping with autism, which is a very complex disease. Yeah. So wide ranging. Mm, right. And what about the different methods of administration? So like you mentioned, you're taking intravenous stem cells, and uh, I guess there's like injectable as well. So like, how does it look like the procedure itself? Like uh, yeah. you know, how many hours so does it take? So when or... people come to our clinic, we do a very detailed consultation. It really depends on what each person needs. Um, I think IV is one of the most powerful methods to help promote healing because not only the stem cells 
will be attracted to the area of inflammation and injury and get out of the blood vessels to help promote changes, but is also interacting with all your immune system, you know, your spleen, your peripheral lymphoid system to get your immune system on board to help repair. And in, the immune system is crucial in how you repair any tissue. So if you can make that connection, talking to your body's, this, 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 this intelligent immune system, then you can make drastic changes. And that's what I've seen clinically. So I think for me, I think IV is important, especially if somebody is older and your, their own regenerative potential is declining or there's any kind of systemic inflammatory conditions. I think the, the IV approach is very important. But if you're looking at local repair, you can always put the cells locally because when you put cells in an intravenous route, it, it is going to be dispersed throughout the body. And if you have a lot of things going on in the body, it may be attracted to a lot of areas. So you end up not having as much in a particular area to help you repair. Mm. Uh, or you may repair one thing, but that's not the thing that you were hoping to get repair for. So that I've seen that happen. And then it may be a good idea to put some cells right into that area, especially if you're looking at larger joints, because larger joints, um, <clears throat> the inside of the joint is based in synovial fluid. That's what's nourishing the cells. But the synovial fluid has very, very, very slow exchange with the blood. It takes a couple months for whatever I put in the blood to really be, you know, saturated in the synovial fluid. And that will be the case that I think stem cell injections right into that joint will be important. So knee, hips, shoulders, so larger joints. The smaller joints like the finger is very well perfused. So the blood will will go right into the joint and those are fine. Uh, so, and then there are other um, places where you may want to inject locally. If you're looking at hair restoration, you can inject into the scalp. If you're looking at facial rejuvenation, you can do the face. Or if some people um, are, you know, seeking sexual rejuvenation, like for the vagina or penis, we can inject right into the area. There are other doctors who will inject stem cells into particular organs. Uh, I don't do that such as injecting, let's say, into the bladder or, you know, into into the heart. You know, I don't do that. I'm, that's not my, those are not my specialties. But what I do have is laser technology, right? And and also, uh, you know, for the brain, there are report reports of injecting stem cells directly into the spinal canal or into the brain itself, uh, which carry the, their, their own risks because these are in, invasive procedures. But with laser therapy that I utilize, I'm able to direct laser at certain organs, and that actually helps with the migration and attraction of the cells. And in that sense, I can target different organs, which is really exciting and, and really beautiful, you know, using these powerful energy, um, you know, energy medicine to, to direct um, certain cells to organs that are hard to reach. Right. Gotcha. Where is like, I guess, uh, where can like people learn more about, uh, you know, yeah, like where do they start or like how can they find some like reliable clinics or like what countries tend to have like uh, these kind of clinics? Because, I, you know, in Estonia, there's no this kind of <laughs> uh, public sector clinic that would do these kind of things. Um, and I guess, you know, a lot of other countries don't have it as well. So like what countries is it very common in? I guess U.S. is the kind of uh, main country. And yeah. Uh, yeah, like how can people like find, okay, this is maybe where I can have a consultation or something like that. Because it's not like, it's like the first option. <laughs> it's mo for most people, it would be like a pretty, requires more consideration. Yeah. So uh, the United States definitely is leading as far as the, the amount of stem cell therapy and the amount of stem cell research so it's definitely number one in the world. China's number two. Um, but there are some restrictions in China, even though it's prevalent. But at, at least from what I heard last time I, was, I spoke with people in China, is that they cannot charge for stem cell therapy. Everything has to be under research. Um, but people get around it in you know, all kinds of ways. But 
Um, the United States, I think it's a really good place, especially if you find providers that get really good products. Uh, of course, you can do stem cell therapy, you know, from your own body, but I talked about the potential issues that, you know, not only they're less effective because they've aged with you and they've also declined, uh, as you, as you go through the aging process, uh, if you have a disease, some of the diseases is a stem cell disease or proposed to be stem cell disease, certain autoimmune conditions that there were dysfunction in the stem cells. So if you're trying to get your own stem cell to heal your own disease, sometimes it won't work very well. Uh, so there's some issues with using your own cells, but you can certainly get that. Um, yeah, it's, um, it, it, it's really hard, I think, to, to kind of siphon through what, what, who is trustworthy, where to go. But uh, this is why I put great emphasis on, on education. I started an academy, American Academy of Integrative Cell Therapy. I actually trained physicians, certifying doctors in stem cell therapy. So the, the website is aaict.org. So if people want to reach out to us and see who are the doctors that have been certified, uh, that's one thing, because I do see a lot of doctors who are doing stem cell therapy without the basic knowledge of stem cells. Mm. And they're kind of taking the direction from company reps as far as how much stem cells to give, you know, where to give them. Um, and that's, you know, not a good way to practice medicine. Um, so, um, and also people need to understand the difference between using native cells that have not been expanded and manipulated versus cells that have been manipulated. Not that People have not seen really good results overseas using expanded cells, but there's much higher chance of side effects. And I do think, you know, even though they can be helpful, but potentially they could be even more helpful if they are native and not expanded. So those are all things to think about. But um, yeah, <laughs> it's a, it's a it, yeah, there are a lot of doctors who are doing it. Mm. People really have to do their own research. Right. And uh, you're based in California, right? Your clinic? Yeah, in Los Angeles. Okay, right. Yeah, um, we do have people flying from all around the world um, to to come see us. Um, yeah. and, and I think a lot of times, I don't, you're in Europe, so you probably know there's this um, grass is always greener on the other side. <laughs> I think America somehow, in a sense, idolize what's going on in Germany or Japan, think that things are always better in these, um, or Switzerland, you know, these uh, high-end countries. And, uh, but I think in Europe, and then they think America is better. You know, things are, I, I know that's mm -hmm. a human, human tendency. Yeah, that's, right. that's how, how we, uh, yeah. our brain works. Yeah, I'm not, yeah, sure about the, stem cell scene in Europe or in any other place. Uh, yeah, I think there's still a lot of restrictions. I think you can still have yeah. a lot more at latitude in the US. Mm. Yeah, and it's for sure more popular in the States. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, it's this has been very interesting uh, conversation and I've learned a lot about this topic. And uh, yeah, before I ask my last question, uh, where can people learn more about you and your work and uh, maybe like contact your clinic or something? Yeah, thank you. So people can always uh, go to my website, just drjoykong.com. And they can also uh, follow my uh, YouTube videos because I do put out a lot of helpful content because I really want people to understand what's going on. Um, you know, I, I'm here to really just help to make people's life better. You know, I really, why are we here? That's, that's a fundamental question. Why are we existing on this planet? So I think my goal is to learn and to grow and to make things better for everybody around me. So that's why I put out these videos so people can understand what they're getting into, you know, just like nobody can be experts in everything, right? So I know a lot about stem cells and I, you know, I, I'm trying to learn things about in other areas. And I really appreciate people who dive deep into certain areas I'm interested in and putting out a lot of helpful videos. So that's what I'm trying to do in the stem cell field. Um, they can also listen to my podcast, the Dr. Joy Kong podcast, or follow me on Instagram at Dr. underscore Joy underscore Kong. 
Uh, so I do respond to people's comments. I'm, I am very friendly and very, um, you know, very responsive when mm. it comes to communicating with everybody. Sounds good. We'll put the link in the description. And uh, my last question is, uh, what's this one piece of advice or habit that you wish you adopted sooner? Uh, piece of advice. Um, I guess I wish I knew about the effect of carbohydrates and uh, how that affected my body. Because growing up in China, I, I actually struggled with weight when I was in China, not knowing why. And that's because some people, even if I grew up in a culture that's full of rice, doesn't mean that my body, you know, I'm, even though I'm Chinese, doesn't mean my body, you know, likes rice. That is good for me. So I think the the insulin, uh, carbohydrate, you know, the the differences in different people's uh, genetic makeup, how they handle that, makes a huge difference. So if people are struggling with weight, and you know, please, you know, get a continuous glucose monitor, check to see if you are having carbohydrate metabolism issues. Um, I could have saved myself so much uh, headache by just eating a, you know, limiting my carbohydrate intake. But instead, I listened to the food pyramid that was told by the government, right? Lots of carbohydrates and very little fat. I was I was working hard at, uh, you know, adhering to that, resulting in this, you know, massive hunger and then binge eating and you know, weight fluctuation. It was terrible. So if I have one advice, you know, as far as health hack goes, check your blood sugar to see how food affects you. You know, I think that's a huge part of slowing down the aging of your body is to make sure that your blood sugar is steady mm, yeah yeah that's interesting like you know i eat a lot of carbohydrates like and much less fat than uh, i do much better uh, with that kind of a diet so yeah it's oh. in individual differences and you've checked your blood sugar uh the continuous glucose monitor yeah i mean it's uh normal my my hemoglobin a1c is like five percent and wow. uh yeah, I mean, a much so you leaner. don't you don't have huge spikes of sugar when you eat carbohydrates. Um, no, it's it's just yeah, pretty normal. Wow, that's amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, that's I think wonderful. I think it's because I like exercise a lot and uh, yeah. just use it for like uh, energy. <laughs> yeah, I was shocked when I was eating even a little bit of I think a salad, healthy salad like quinoa. And my blood sugar shot up. I think also because the dressing has some sugar. And right. when I, of course, if I eat Chinese food um, or one time even Vietnamese food with the rice noodles, mm. my blood sugar shot up. It's, uh, yeah, it's amazing how <laughs> how we're built differently. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's been uh, great to uh, meet you, meet you, meet with you and the uh, talk. And uh, yeah, thank you for coming to the podcast. Yeah, I really enjoy speaking with you. You asked some great questions, and I think this is going to be very helpful for people. Yeah, I'll see you around. Thank you. All right, that's it for this episode. Make sure you check out my new book, The Longevity Leap, on Amazon. I'd also appreciate if you share this episode with a friend or family member. Other than that, my name is Seem. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered.